Join us for another installment in our Sussex and Kent road trip. In this video, we will travel through Kent, visiting the picturesque village of Chilham, shown here, as well as stopping by the aptly named Old Wives Lees, discover the Jane Austen linkage to the lovely Godmersham Park, have a quintessentially British stop in the village of Benenden, explore the beautiful and fascinating Sissinghurst Castle Garden, stop by a farm stand in the Garden of England to buy some Kentish cherries, and finish off the day by dining in style in historic Tenterden. Ian and I have wanted to visit Kent for a long time, and we're finally here. We are going to be recapping for you in this video a bunch of little villages and towns around Kent that we're visiting on our anniversary trip this week. First stop, Chillum. Well, the first place we've encountered in Chillum is this lovely half-timbered home, which is all dilapidated and abandoned and fenced up. So Ian says we need to, uh, to buy it and give it some TLC. But honestly, the buildings here are lovely. Oh, and this wisteria would be great when it's blooming. Not only is this tea shop in a beautiful building, but it has the cutest name, the Church Mouse Tea Rooms. And I love here, it says Kentish cream teas served with clotted cream. So my question is, what makes a cream tea Kentish? Not sure I'm gonna have a chance to find out, but I'm very curious. Well, if this isn't just a picture postcard perfect village, I don't know what is. Standing here in the village square, I guess. Look at the buildings, just beautiful. The birds are chirping. And over here, what do we have? A castle. It's closed, but let's go peek through the bars and see what we can see. Oh, that is lovely. So this is a private home, but the gardens are open two days a week. And today is not one of those days, but it is fun to just peek through the railings <laughs> to see this unique Jacobean architecture. In addition to the peek through the gate, let's also have a wee look at the castle in this aerial view from the drone. What a nice wooded setting this castle is positioned in. And there are two gatehouses here on either side of the gate. I would be perfectly happy to live in one of these gatehouses. So if one comes up for sale, you just need to send me the right move listing and very appropriate to the area we are in. This wooden carving is called Pilgrim Milestone. And we spent most of the day at Canterbury Cathedral, so definitely aware of what an important spot of pilgrimage this area of Kent is. Huh, I guess there are not a lot of Alfa Romeos in Chilliam because no one's parking anywhere near that sign, except my observant husband just pointed out that this is an Alfa Romeo right here. So maybe what's under that car cover is an Alfa Romeo too. And perhaps an Alfa Romeo enthusiast lives in this home. We'll walk down School Hill and see if there's a school there. Yes, in fact, this is a very pretty primary school here. And it looks like it has something to do with herons, egrets, whatever the white birds with black beaks and long black legs are that stand in the water. All right, since every day is a school day, we're gonna stand here in front of the school and Ian is gonna school me on Kentish architectural vernacular. This is a home with typical Kentish vernacular architecture. You've got the tiles on the roof and then you've got the tiles on the first floor and then brick below that. Also lots of brick as well as half timber and then the tiles on top, the red tile roofs. So this awesome village square has the half timber houses all around it the castle on one end, and then what looks to be a really cool church on the other end. So we're gonna go check that out. We just discovered, looking at this sign, that we are currently in the North Downs, and there's a North Downs Way National Trail where you can kind of walk in the footsteps of pilgrims. This is a really cool looking church. It's got the local flint stone that it's made out of. It's got a massive clock up on the clock tower. So let's go inside and find out some more information about it if we can. There's evidence that there was a church here in the Doomsday Book in 1085. Building records for 
this building go back to 1280 when the present Norman structure was constructed here. And then with additional modifications, it is now classified as an English perpendicular architectural style. There is an unsubstantiated legend that the bones of St. Augustine, who died in 605, were brought here to this church to protect them from the plundering of Canterbury Cathedral during the dissolution of the monasteries. Indeed, Chillum is a very historic and old village. It has been inhabited since prehistoric times, and it was an Anglo-Saxon stronghold for several years after the Romans were driven out. After 1066, when William the Conqueror exterminated the local Anglo-Saxon opposition, Chillum became a permanent Norman base. During Tudor times, there was stability in the village, and it appears that that's when the village was built up and most of the beautiful buildings we see today were constructed. If you are British, tell me if you have ever eaten at a pub called the Woolpack Inn anywhere. It seems like a name I've heard several times. This one here in Chillum, though, started in 1480. So I'm excited to go experience local cuisine. This pub definitely seems like a place for locals, not tourists. I'll try not to be too obnoxious. I'm eating at the Woolpack Inn. Isn't that perfect? What's perfect is the decor in this place. You got a little Canterbury Tales. You got some hops hanging from the ceiling. It's awesome. That's Ian's stack of chicken and bacon and vegetables. And here's my crispy tofu and all kinds of vegetables. Here's a quick recap of our dinner. We didn't want to talk there inside the pub because first of all, it was way too noisy. And second of all, I'd already looked like enough of an obnoxious YouTuber <laughs> filming around the decor of the pub. So I didn't yeah. want to do that anymore. Ian's meal was surprisingly large and yummy. When I read mm -hmm. the description, I didn't think it was going to be as good as what he got. It was good, yeah. My weird vegan thing I ordered was good. It just was kind of a small portion. So Ian took pity on me and he gave me a piece of his bacon. <laughs> it's like, you know what the, that vegan meal needs? Piece of bacon. Bacon. <laughs> so thank you, sweetie. That was very, that was very kind of you. You're welcome. Um, and then Ian further took pity on me by agreeing to order a sticky toffee pudding. So Ian, tell about your your rule of thumb for d determining if it's a good sticky toffee pudding. You have to shake it. And if you shake it and it jiggles, it has to have the right kind of jiggle. If it does, then it's a good sticky toffee pudding because it's really moist, mm. high moisture content. Mm -hmm. Here's what I think about sticky to toffee pudding is it needs to have a good moat of sticky toffee sauce. Mm. Now that sticky toffee pudding, the pudding itself was fantastic. It was really, really good. Mm -hmm. The cakey part, you know, the actual pudding. Yeah. But the moat, they had butterscotch sauce instead of an actual toffee sauce, mm -hmm. which was fine. But it was just not very much. It was just like a little. And the ice cream we got with it. Of course, we tried replacing <laughs> the custard with ice cream and then they gave us ice cream. But it was a they gave us very a small thing. Thimble full of yeah. ice cream. It was very tasty. But um, but yeah, not quite enough of a moat of toffee sauce for my my life. You, you, you have high expectations when they've been serving people meals for 500 plus years. <laughs> yep. I don't think they served tofu back in 1480, whatever. No, no. Um, but they, they probably were serving chicken. They, they probably were serving chicken and bacon. They've perfected the chicken and the bacon. Yeah. If you are a big fan of sticky toffee puddings and you have not yet seen my summer of sticky toffee puddings video about the summer that I ate 10 sticky toffee puddings, check that out. Isn't this the cutest little telephone booth? Very Kentish. Actually, now I don't understand this. It's like bus shelter next to a phone box, but the side of the bus shelter says telephone on it. I am I being daft? Someone explain that to me. And by the way, that bird was definitely a heron, not an egret. They have these really cool signs here in Chillum. There's this one with the crest on top, and then there's this really cool one that has the heron on it. Well, that's a very descriptive name to put on a little lane. Next, we made another unplanned stop. I am a woman of a certain age on a trip for my 31st wedding anniversary. So when I saw there was a village called Old Wives Lees 
you know I had to make a detour for a visit and get Ian to take silly photos of me standing next to the sign. I spoke to a longtime resident of the village and tried to explain why we were there, and he just did not understand. I guess to him, the name of the village isn't funny. Now we are stopping in the village of Godmersham, which one of the claims to fame is that Godmersham Park was owned by Jane Austen's brother, and she spent a lot of time here and allegedly did some writing here. So it's a small village that we are just coming to check out the church and take a peek at the estate and see what we can learn. Jane Austen's novel Mansfield Park is said to have been inspired by this estate. Her brother's name was Edward Austen Knight. The parish church of St. Lawrence the Martyr is a Saxon church. It was altered in 1865 and it contains memorials to the Brodnicks and Austen Knight families. The tower is Norman from about 1070 AD. The east end is about 13th century and the south aisle and porch are 19th century. Jane Austen did worship here with her brother and his family. I wish I could go inside and show you the church as well as the memorials inside it, but unfortunately it's locked. This is a lovely big yew tree here in the churchyard with a nice little headstone below it. Kind of a Celtic type cross, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know what this little building is in the churchyard, but it is just so tiny and quaint. I love it. I wonder if it's the grave digger's hut. This is the old vicarage. We can just kind of barely peek in through the gate. These are cottages, which have been made from the stables. This is Court Lodge. This is the forge, which has a really cool sign. And then this is the tithe barn, which looks pretty huge and is interesting because it has such a very steep gigantic roof looks like they've converted it into flats and it would be really interesting to see how they did that with that steep pitch of a roof line this is a picture of what godmersham park would have looked like back in the 1700s when jane austen would have visited her brother edward there and his wife elizabeth and their children and if you look at the 10 pound note with Jane Austen's face on it, you will also see an illustration of Godmersham Park House. This is just another beautiful little village. Lots of red brick homes. This is a gate, I think, back to the original estate, but just in here is a public footpath that I'm gonna walk down. So this is the lodge to the estate. And there's actually a college here now. There are beautiful willow trees and a river and a lovely old bridge and the sound of sheep bleating in the background. There's my cute husband walking across the bridge. Oh, this river just looks really tranquil. is kind of a garden folly that someone built. Here in this incredibly bucolic scene. Okay, look at me again. You were just looking at me. Hey, look at me. There you are. Hello. Hello, sheepies. This just looks like the kind of landscape that people want to paint. With these beautiful, huge oak trees. This is a very pretty house. I love what they've done with the flowers and the shutters. I had to film this. We're driving on our way to Sissinghurst, which is in Kent. And we go through this little village called Benenden and we were uh, joking about the name and how you say it. And then all of a sudden there's this beautiful, huge village green. And then there's guys playing cricket on it, even though it's pouring rain, it's chucking it down right now. <laughs> and so there's this big field full of cricketers and off in the distance, a picturesque village church. I mean, how British is that? All in the pouring rain. As avid fans of gardens, we are not going to cry about the fact that it's raining. We need this water here. Well, we have arrived at Sissinghurst but it is raining. So instead of going around the garden first, we're going to go to the cafe. 
also were starving. It appears that the restaurant is in the old stables, which is often the case for National Trust properties, it seems. I've never had a press, so I decided to have this Costin press with rhubarb, apples, and sparkling water, so we'll see how it is. It's tart, but actually very refreshing. Just disappointing that it's not magenta colored. It's been a very long time since breakfast, so we are starving. We've got a veggie frittata with some kind of very interesting looking slaw and then a jacket potato with beans and cheese. Haven't had a jacket potato in ages. And in a stroke of luck, it stopped raining and the sun came out just after we finished eating our lunch. Sissinghurst began life as a Saxon pig farm and within a few years, it had become a small moated manor house. Nothing remains today of the original house but by the late 16th century, the site had been transformed by the affluent Baker family who built a magnificent Renaissance courtyard house, complete with vaulted gallery, 37 fireplaces, and a tower at its center. Leased to the government during the Seven Years' War, Sissinghurst was used as a prison camp for 3,000 captured French sailors. And during this time, the house fell into disrepair. It was during this period that Sissinghurst became known as Chateau de Sissinghurst, or Sissinghurst Castle, as a sarcastic joke because of the prisoners' living conditions. Vita Sackville West and Harold Nicholson bought Sissinghurst Castle in 1930 and started creating their home amongst a now world-famous garden. These are some of my very favorite flowers, magenta dahlias, just lovely. Here we are in the village of Sissinghurst and I just need to show you this. And they have a place called The Street here as well. This must be a Kent thing. Is that what they call the High Street in Kent? The Garden of England, all kinds of cherries and strawberry stands and pick your own. There's all kinds of roadside vegetables and fruits for sale in Kent. It appears to be cherry season, so we had to stop and get some Sissenhurst cherries from Aragon Farm. I mean, we're in the Garden of England and it's cherry season. And it would be rude not to. This is Bedenden, and it is a very charming village as well. Okay, I didn't think I was dyslexic, but maybe I am, or maybe I'm just really tired because I made Ian stop so I could take a picture of this road sign which I thought said collision place, but it's actually Collison. <laughs> I really wanted to try eating dinner at this place called the Lemon Tree in Tenterden because allegedly Henry VIII ate there and it's just this really old pub that's beautiful, but it's totally closed, so that's a bummer. So this is really funny. After walking up and down the high street and deciding that none of the pub grub sounded like what we wanted to eat tonight, we decided to splurge and eat at the highest rated restaurant in Tenterden, which is an Italian restaurant. It's called Montalbano. And I ordered this lovely sounding scallop chicken dish that comes with kind of a caprese salad on the side. And the waitress said, would you like fries with that? And I just about busted out laughing. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not British, so I think eating fries with Italian food is weird. <laughs> so go ahead and leave me hate comments if you want, but I just think that fries or chips are delicious, but not with Italian food. Ian got this beef ragu on pappardelle pasta with a stracciatella cheese on top. And both our meals were absolutely delicious, even though we didn't have fries or chips with them. We decided not to order dessert from the Italian restaurant. Instead, we decided to come back to our Airbnb and eat those delicious Cordia cherries that we bought from the farm stand earlier today.
I hope you enjoyed another whirlwind visit to loads of fun places in Kent in this installment of our road trip. Stay tuned for our next episode in which we will visit the historic and lovely town of Hastings as well as the village of Mayfield. And after that, we begin our visits to some fabulous castles connected to the wives of Henry VIII. Thanks so much for joining us on this journey and do something good in the world today.